Hunting in oh, Asia oh, has its oh, share oh, of challenges, but it also has its rewards. Team Huskama first braved the elements of Kyrgyzstan while in pursuit of Marco Polo and Mid-Asian Ibex. Then we searched high and low for Gobi and Hungai Argali across Mongolia. With our sights now set on the big boys of Tajikistan, we joined Best of the West pro dealer Adam Olivas and good friend Don Jackson on their late season Marco Polo hunts. Salam alaik, my name is Yusuf. Masha Nur Labkhosh, Adam and Donald in Tarmash Khisayat, Chikhiv Tarmash Lager. Tajikistan is a beautiful country and Marco Polo hunting is a pinnacle of hunting. If you are planning to come for a Marco Polo hunt, an Ibex hunt, you should be prepared to be in good physical condition first of all, as here it's a high altitude. Secondly, your shooting ability should be at the top, as most of our hunts are being between 400 to 800 yards. It's a bit difficult at such altitude to get in a shooting position and everything goes fast. Those who are coming for first time, they should be really ready for this kind of tough hunt. Our camp is at 12,000 feet, around 12,500 feet, and our hunting usually takes place between 14,000 to 16,000 feet. We've been using for the last 20 years an old lodge, but we just built a brand new lodge. Luckily, Adam and Donald were the first ones to go through it. A lot of our food is traditional. We mostly eat yak. Well, for sure, Marco Polo, Ibex after hunt, and different types of cuisine. Yep, okay, got it. Mine was behind me. Yep, 200 yards. Two it up. Your elevation is perfect. You're about... Uh, 9 o'clock. Exactly, 9 o'clock. A big part of Marco Polo hunt is what it takes to actually get here. Outside of all of the preparation and readiness uh, of making sure that you're able to conduct the hunt. We started traveling on a Saturday and didn't get here into camp until Tuesday for starting to hunt on a Wednesday. Hunters are geared a bit differently than most people and sheep hunters are definitely different than most hunters. For most sheep hunters that I've seen, uh, Marco Polo is uh, a lifetime goal. Um, this hunt has always been on my mind. So when Vosif and I met each other about three years ago, I started putting this plan together and searched very deliberately for the right place to hunt, the right people to hunt with. Day one of this hunt was exceptional for any hunt, but definitely a sheep hunt. We had eyes on the ram we wanted to go after in the first three hours, I believe. We drove out from camp, got to the base of some of the mountains that hold the sheep, started glassing, and uh, it wasn't very long before we saw an absolute monster. We began our climb and uh, got up to where we could see them from uh, a better vantage point, and clearly he's the guy that we wanted to go after. Absolutely exceptional ram. Couldn't get a great position on him that day. So we knew that uh, we had to back out and make an attempt on him day two. When we spotted the ram that we saw on day one, we knew that he was in a position where we wanted to take a little bit more time getting to him. It was gonna be difficult getting into a shooting position uh, just because of where he and his lambs and ewes were. So we made our climb, and uh, when we finally got in position, he was at about 500 yards, but uh, there was not a whole lot of bullet path for us to work with because the hill that we were on didn't give us a, much of a shooting position. Trying to stay as low as possible, but still clear all the rocks that were in front of us, the only shooting position we really had was a, uh, a kneeling shot. After being in position for about 30 minutes, the rams bunched up lower in the group altogether. Uh, we could see him, but I didn't have a bullet path because we had rocks at about 30 yards in front of us. Uh, eventually, the rams moved up a little higher and he gave me a broadside shot. Give me a distance, give me a distance. 
You could tell immediately that he was hit hard, uh, but he ran off with the uh, the rest of the herd, and we just started packing up a little bit, knowing we were going to have to follow a blood trail. Once we started tracking him, we could see him at about uh, 130 yards or so, but he was facing us directly. Uh, any shot I would have had on him would have risked hitting the horns or hitting him in the face. So the only opportunity that I had to get a clean shot on him really was to walk this ridge line that he was just a few meters below. Once we got to about 60 yards, we could still see him laying down just the tops of his horns. And it was clear that we were making too much noise in the rocks. I'm a bow hunter, so uh, ditching boots and going to socks is not out of the ordinary. So that's what I ended up doing just so I can get closer to him without him knowing I was there. I've been on a lot of hunts where an animal's hit and wounded and you think that it's dead and all of a sudden it comes back to life and runs off. So I wasn't going to risk that here. Uh, so ended up getting to about 25 yards and uh, that's where I put the final shot into him once I peeked over the ridge. He was right there. Walking up to every other animal that I've hunted uh, is always a surreal experience. The connection that you've got with the animal is nothing that I've ever heard anybody describe well enough. But walking up to a Marco Polo that was this extraordinary it wasn't anything that I was prepared for. A wave of emotion came over me that, uh, that I've never felt before hunting any other animal. Yeah, you weren't lying when you said uh, that we'd shoot him somewhere around 16,000 feet. Uh, it's not like at 15,500 approximately. Yeah. Yep, right in there within a few feet. Pretty unbelievable to think what these guides are capable of. They know the sheep's movement so well. They think just like the sheep. They know the directions that they might go and how to set up for it. That is the hunt right there. You and these guides are absolutely unbelievable with how well you can predict the behavior of the sheep. This is the absolute pinnacle. Uh, a gigantic ram who was clearly the, uh, the alpha in his herd and the band of rams that he was hanging out with. Thank Once you. Again. Thank you very Congrats. much. There's a handful of people that I'd really like to thank for making this hunt possible. First and foremost, my wife, Nidia, who has grown to understand my, uh, my passion and addiction for hunting. Uh, she supports it quite a bit. And secondly, Wade Brown at Best of the West, who not only has been an incredible sponsor for years, but also just has given me exceptional customer service for any of my shooting needs. And last but definitely not least, uh, Josh Cleghorn, the president at Cryptek, who has uh, not only been a sponsor and outfitted me for uh, the last several years of my hunting, but uh, has also been uh, an incredible resource for making sure that I find the right people to hunt with. Adam and I were hoping to be able to hunt together. Uh, we like operating as a team. Um, I love, good heavens, I love operating as a team with him, especially when long-range shooting's involved. Uh, I've been a financial advisor my whole career, coming up on 30 years now. Uh, Adam was a, a U.S. Navy SEAL sniper. That guy knows a little bit about long-range shooting. So to have him walk me onto a target, you know, at, at 500 to 1,000 yards, and to have him make wind calls, that man's got a skill set that, that few other people on the earth have. So I love hunting with him in that kind of a, kind of a team function. That, that mark is what you care about. We're done with Adams at one. We've got three hours. Let's do a little bit of scouting. It was within an hour we picked up another herd. There was a clear alpha male in that herd. Uh, he was old. He was a fighter. He was scarred up. We started pursuing, you know, spot and stock kind of a situation and had a few times where we thought we might even be able to set up a shot. But they were, they were moving, and by the time we could get even close to in position, they were gone again. And right before it would have been too late for me to feel comfortable shooting, right before that we got on them, you know, one last time, and it was just a boiling herd of animals. That I, I don't know how many was in the herd, 50, 75, I don't know, uh, too many to count. 
and Adam and I were having a hell of a time. I mentioned how much I appreciate him as a spotter. Uh, we were having a hell of a time figuring out which one was the right one as they were all clumped up. So I'm looking at the world through my, through my scope, you know, almost looking at the world through a microscope. And he's got a spotting scope with a much broader field of vision. And, uh, and it took little time, but we were able to identify which one was the right one. And he gave us a heartbeat of, of an opportunity. Okay, you have a shot here. Can you take it? Yes. Center mass. He's down. You just smoked a tank. And it was a one and done. He didn't take a step, he dropped in his tracks. And I think that was 607 yards uh, through the herd. You know, we didn't have a full picture of him. I had, I had enough of a patch of hair on the right animal that I was pretty confident I could get the job done. It was not the Texas whitetail hunting shots that I grew up with. It was, it was a little bit different. And I, and I couldn't have been more pleased. And, and good Lord, that guy was a tank. Well done, buddy. Thank you very, very much. well done. You know, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have felt comfortable taking that shot with anybody but you. You threaded the needle on that one. Uh, it was the only opportunity you were gonna have, and you yeah. took it. Uh, you didn't pucker up at all. It was, it was just go time. It's better to be lucky than good, and this was a yep. lucky situation. Lucky situation, and he is a beautiful ram. When we get back to our side of the world, the first, third, fifth, and seventh drinks are on me. After that, we arm wrestle for him, all right? Deal. Deal. Well done, buddy. Thanks. Very nice hunt. These men that are the guides here, tough as leather and hardworking. And to see the respect that they pay to the animal and, and them wanting to have pictures that they can show their friends and their family with this animal uh, tells me that, uh, that, I, that I wasn't kidding myself when, when I thought I'd found quite a beast. I'm, I'm so hesitant to use the word trophy because I, I don't know, it just doesn't resonate right with me. Um, I grew up as a meat hunter. Uh, my, my dad was an avid deer hunter his whole life. I think I took my first deer when I was nine, and my dad brought me up to shoot the doe because that's meat on the table. So I'm, I'm so hesitant to use the word trophy because that's not what it's about for me. There's at least a couple of our guides here that, that live in a village that doesn't have electricity or running water. So I am quite confident that these, that these fine men are not going to let that meat go to waste. Uh, they're going to they're gonna feed their families and be damn thankful for it. And that, and that does my soul good. Having the extra time, because this hunt that was originally going to be seven days, nine days, something like that, having both of our hunts completed for, for Marco Polo's within the first two days, we certainly had some, some spare time. And this is excellent Ibex country as well. I got a little too big for my britches because uh, the previous day on that Marco Polo we were at 15 and a half thousand feet of elevation something like that which is the highest I've ever been. Texas to Oklahoma where I live now is 700 feet above sea level so getting up to 15.5 was, was, was quite a thing and it didn't give me problems at all and I thought sure let's go after Ibex that sounds like a great idea. Um, too big for my britches. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when our guides with these amazing eagle eyes of theirs spotted a herd of ibex and, and certainly a very respectable billy among them, the first thing was to get in position, which we commenced to climb in a, hell, it was a giant pile of rocks, and I mean giant pile of rocks. It took an hour and a half to climb this thing and we got up to approaching 17,000 feet. The altitude started to talk to me. Um, the altitude started to talk to me. And it took us an hour, give or take, to find this guy on the opposite giant pile of rocks. And when I say giant, I'm guessing these, these things you would call mountains or rock piles were probably 2,000 feet high, uh, something like that, you know, pretty, pretty big. And these animals look just like the rocks that they live amongst. So it took about an hour to, to get on them. 
I am bone tired from the climb up. It was, I think, a 903 yard shot. And Adam was able to walk me onto the target, you know, looking at points on the terrain as reference points and, and directing my line of fire from there. And he was able to get me on him and make the wind call. Don't you smoke them! <laughs> The Best of the West is brought to you by Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. Hunt and Fool. The Best of the West Shooting Systems. Defiance Custom Actions. The Wild Sheep Foundation. Huskama Optics and LongRangeStore.com. For more information about the products and gear used on today's show, please visit longrangestore.com or call 1-866-754-7618. One left. One left. Don't you smoke them! <laughs> it was a one-shot tin ring, and that guy folded up like that and I just slumped over in absolute exhaustion there was there I had nothing left in the tank there was nothing of me left uh, the climb was one thing the strain on the eyes trying to find him was another and then and then holding position at the kind of range where where your breath is huge but even your heartbeat is enough to take you off the target it drained me there was there was nothing left in me um, and I and I just rolled over and I don't think I was hyperventilating, but I was gasping for air. I thought I was doing so great getting up to 15.5 the day before on the Marco Polo. I think the the max altitude we got to uh, on the Ibex chase was was somewhere in the 17s, 17.5, I guess. Can I say kicked my ass? It kicked my ass inside out and sideways. It uh, I I felt my age. I felt my age, and there were, there were a couple of points I thought, I'm going to have a freaking heart attack. This is the most exhausted I think I've ever been in my life. I, there is nothing left in the tank. I, uh, I didn't know I was capable of, of doing this. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm a little, I'm a little shocked. Uh, I never imagined I would be in a place like this. The, there's nothing left in the tank. I'm done. Funny story about how I got acquainted with Best of the West. When I was hunting with a buddy just on the Texas side of, uh, of the Rio Grande uh, near Ojenaga, Mexico. And I was very pleased with myself because I, I made a hell of a shot on, uh, on this hunt. You know, 250 yards or something like that. And the next day, my buddy I was hunting with uh, made a 740-yard shot. <laughs> and I said, good Lord, how did you do that? And he says, here, take a look at my rifle. It's kind of hard to miss with this thing. And I, and I looked at his rifle, and I realized that there had been some innovations in, in gun making since, since my grandfather's Belgian Browning was made probably around 1945 or 1950. Uh, there, you know, there had been some changes. And he says, you want me to introduce you to my gun guy? <laughs> I said, yeah, I think I do. And, and that was my introduction to Best of the West. And I've been uh, very fortunate to attend a, a Best of the West Long Range Shooting School. And I could go 10 times over and pick up something new every time. And I have every intention of continuing to go to the Best of the West Shooting Schools right there in, in Cody. It's been time well spent to go to school, and it's, it's taught me a lot. Uh, I've still got a lot to learn, but it's taught me a lot. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of The Best of the West. Be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the latest long-range hunting adventures.